Well, I'd like to start out by thanking uh, Dr. Steve Martin for having the vision to put this together, to bring us all together, to focus uh, on uh, what is very important for us uh, uh, in, these, in these days ahead. And so I'm, I'm very appreciative to, to Dr. Martin for doing this. Um, I'm Ken Collins. Uh, I'm a professor of historical theology and Wesley studies here at Asbury. Um, I teach, obviously, in those areas of church history and Wesley studies. I also am a student uh, of American religion, and that's my training. And um, I've written a couple of books on American evangelicalism, which, of which I have an abiding, abiding interest. Um, I'm not going to begin with Wesley today. I'm not going to begin with Jesus Christ today. Well, what's this guy up to? <laughs> I don't think we can start there. Not today. Not in 2016. Not in people who want to be serious disciples of Jesus Christ. I, I don't think we begin there. And I have no notes for you up on the screen. I have no PowerPoints because I have thought long and hard about what I want to say to you this morning to really get us going here in this conference. And so I just put the finishing touches on it this morning. Okay? But I believe it's that important. We need to talk about context. Context first. The context, the environment, the culture in which, in a certain sense, we live and move and have our being. We need to look at that first. Don't make the mistake that I made in life, and it's, you know, I chalk it up as one of the big mistakes I made in life, and, and it's true. So here is a moment of confession for me. Uh, I did not understand the context in which I was operating as I was evangelizing, preaching, teaching, because I was so caught up in the beauty and the wonder of the gospel, which is magnificent, that I think, I don't need to know that. And the Lord showed me, no, you do need to know that. You do. You do. It's both and, not either or. It's both and. And so I had... After my powerful evangelical conversion, I had later on in life, in middle age, an awakening where I understood the context in which I was operating in, and I saw it clearly. And, but I did not become cynical, because some people do. When, when they rub their nose in this North American culture, and they see it for what it really is, in an honest and forthright way, they turn cynical. I didn't do that, <laughs> uh, because uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, he didn't change, okay? I changed. I changed. And it was an important change. I needed, needed to do that. Um, I know in my own graduate training, um, you have the opportunity of those many years of running across uh, some important works. And I ran across a, a book by H. Richard Niebuhr, The Social Sources of Denominationalism. And that was a book that, for me, was a part of this process of understanding context better. Um, what is the gospel? In a certain sense, it is the universal. See, our culture doesn't like that word today. Universal. Universal. All men, all women, all people. Universal love of God manifested in Christ Jesus our Lord, transcending race and gender and ethnicity and economic status and all the ways we love to divide ourselves up into tribes. Okay? That, that's what the gospel is. The universal love of God manifested in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And that's what I saw as a young man of 22 years old. 22 years old, powerful evangelical conversion. After, by the way, reading John Wesley's 52 standard sermons. Yeah, digesting them. Wesley's sermons in one hand, the Bible in the other. Is what Wesley's saying true? Yes, it is true. I hadn't heard it before. <laughs> it was all new to me. I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and it was all new to me. Okay, uh, But the power of Niebuhr's book is that though we know Christ and we know the gospel, uh, how is church practiced on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m.? You know, we, we break up. We rally around race. We rally around economic status. I mean, I can illustrate that from my own journey. When I was teaching at Methodist University in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where Fort Bragg is, my wife invited, my wife is an occupational therapist, and she invited uh, her coworker and her husband to church. And they came one time, and they never came again. So I said, find out why. Why didn't they come? And it was the husband. The husband did not want to come again to Hay Street United Methodist Church in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Why? Because he felt put upon. Because of the cars in the parking lot. Okay? And so this is just one way that, that even when we don't intend it, we move down these tribes. We move down into these tribes you know, of economic status. We're more comfortable uh, not among the poor, you see, uh, but among the middle class, all these sorts of things. Well, we're backing away in some sense when we do that uh, from, from the gospel. I've read another book fairly recently, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about in a few moments, that uh, has greatly disturbed me. Uh, and I'm still wrestling with it, and I'm fighting with the author. I'm kicking back, uh, saying, no, this, this can't be so. But he brings out demographic after demographic after demographic and says, no, it is so. You better understand the context in which the church operates. And that the division is not simply in culture, it's in the church. Okay? You, can, you can't separate it by stained glass walls. Okay. And this is a book by Mark Smith. Mark Smith, uh, it's called Secular Faith. Secular Faith, he is a professor at the University of Washington, Washington State. Uh, Mark Smith, the uh, book came out fairly recently, I think maybe last year, 2015. Uh, how culture has trumped faith Culture has trumped faith in American politics. And so he starts out uh, with his thesis, I'm going to show in the subsequent chapters that Christians have openly or tacitly accepted many modern ideas by either changing their long-standing positions or by retreating, refraining from political action. And so what he is going to argue in this book is that the norms and values of our society, of our culture, that they are evolving, that the rank and file of religious groups, they often change right along with the culture, but usually it's at a slower rate. They're usually like uh, 15, 20 years behind, but they eventually get there. They eventually get there. Uh, and so he says, actually, that religious leaders do not necessarily maintain a fixed viewpoint across the generations. They don't. They, too, change as culture changes. And he says there are three basic responses here, three basic responses that religious leaders take. The first uh, is that sometimes Christian leaders do hold firm. And they insist that the Bible and Christian tradition cause them to reject some of the moral and political changes that are playing out in culture. So that's, that's a first view uh, that he's arguing. Then, secondly, 
there are those uh, religious leaders who they accommodate to the cultural trends, but they keep quiet about it. They do it sort of tacitly, silently, um, uh, and so they decline to press for change at the government level or the political level, even though they have moved over. They really have moved over in all sorts of ways. And then finally, there are those uh, who openly change their moral, political stances, even their religious views to match, to match the prevailing spirit of the age. This is what he writes. This is what he writes. What are examples of this? Uh, some of these you know, sound arcane, uh, uh, but were actually culturally significant at the time. The first one he mentions is this prohibition in the Bible against usury or interest. Okay, that was once a big deal. It's not a big deal to us. Uh, we grow up in democratic capitalistic societies and we're used to it. We expect it. Um, but that uh, involved a change. And so he talks about Christians over several centuries. It took that amount of time to change their beliefs about the morality of charging, of charging interest. Then, rather interestingly, he talks about, and, and lots of Americans don't even realize this because it's a little too far back in the past, but the issue of contraception. Uh, there were once in this country federal laws against contraception. There was the Comstack, uh, Comstock Act of 1873. That was a federal law that prohibited the mailing of any article or thing designed or intended for the prevention of contraception. Uh, that was a federal law. Okay? Now, we, we are not in that place today, and many Americans would be surprised if you even mentioned that. There was once a federal law prohibiting contraception. And in the past, the Roman Catholic Church once supported state laws criminalizing the sale and distribution of contraceptives to anyone, to any American, whether Roman Catholic or no. Now, they believed they were justified in calling for those laws uh, based on an appeal to natural law. In other words, natural law obligates all people not simply Roman Catholics. And so that was their justification for seeking this for all. Now, no Roman Catholic officials in America today will call for the reinstating uh, of birth control laws, even though uh, their view uh, in many respects has not changed. See, so they become that second category we talked about earlier. They're not pressing for laws because they understand the context in which they are operating it, the culture has changed. The culture will not allow. There'll be too much blowback from it. Now, don't get the impression that all cultural change is negative. It's not. It's not. It's, it's far more complicated and sophisticated than that. And so he lifts up, of course, the whole important area of, of slavery and abolitionism. Uh, and he argues, although I, I disagree with him rather strongly here, uh, he argues that the big engine for abolitionism was not the church. It was enlightened philosophs, people like Jefferson and the philosophers Rousseau, and people unraveling uh, and, and bringing into being in culture that new perspective. However, I would argue that even people like John Locke were informed by the Christian faith uh, in key ways, especially when you read Locke, his second treatise on government, his appeal to natural law, moral law, etc. So, you know, that's, that's one area I have a little debate uh, with uh, Professor Smith here. But at any rate, um, you know, we've made that cultural shift. Then, getting more close to home now, where we can start to feel a little of this pain and maybe even some complicity. Um, he talks about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Divorce and remarriage, and how that has played out culturally in the United States. If we go back, not too far, go back to 1908. 1908, only about 7% of marriages ended in divorce. 
there were lots of social, cultural pressures to hold marriages together. There were. Okay. Um, today, of course, and you've heard these statistics just as I, it's not quite 50%, but uh, a very high percentage in the 40s percentage of marriages break up today. Um, and he attributes that to shifts that have taken place culturally, legally. He uh, refers to uh, California in 1969. They were the first state to pass the nation's no-fault divorce laws. No-fault divorce laws. And so by 1985, uh, all states had enacted some form of no-fault divorce. What he argues Interestingly enough, after this cultural change, the churches basically acceded to it. They went along. They went along. How the churches think about divorce and remarriage today uh, you know, is very similar to what the culture uh, has done. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand divorce and remarriage is a complicated issue, and I realize there, there are exceptions. Uh, you know, Matthew 5 mentions exceptions, and I'm not trying to adjudicate and, and resolve this whole issue. I realize it is difficult. Uh, but when we are talking about Christians, I mean, uh, three and four times, three and four marriages, uh, that's no longer marriage. That's serial monogamy. Uh, uh, and, and we need to be honest enough to say it. Uh, we need to be honest enough to say that. And so has the ground shifted in terms of how we think about marriage, how we think about this covenanted relationship? Who informs the script here? Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, the gorilla on the couch, uh, homosexuality. Homosexuality. And so listen to this. Some very interesting uh, facts here that we seem to forget in our current cultural hubbub uh, for nearly 2,000 years. Christian theologians had declared homosexual practices, and we do want to make a distinction. We're, we're making a distinction of being a homosexual, uh, which the church can embrace, and we do embrace, uh, so long as you live as single heterosexual men and women live celibate lives. We embrace homosexuals. Asbury Theological Seminary embraces homosexuals, okay? Uh, and, and we know that they are called to a celibate life just like our heterosexual males and females are called to a celibate life, okay? So he does make that distinction, uh, but he shows that in terms of the perspective of the church, uh, it declared homosexual practices sinful for 2,000 years, basically. Uh, the key theologian he's quoting here is Augustine, uh, and here's what Augustine writes. Those shameful acts against nature, such as were committed in Sodom, ought everywhere and always to be detested and punished. Okay? Now, when we think about the kinds of conversations that we have in this society, Here's some very interesting facts. You're all familiar with the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature? You're all familiar with that? You've been to the library, you've done some research? Well, uh, if you look at the early editions of this guide, uh, which spanned, by the way, about 2,500 pages, um, homosexuality does not appear as a topic, as a topic until uh, the 1929-1932 edition, uh, in other words, in volume six. So from 1900 uh, to 1929, there were no entries on homosexuality, okay? Just so you get a sense of, you know, where we are in the conversation. Lots of people, for example, ask me today, what did John Wesley think about homosexuality? Not much, not much. It just wasn't an issue. It's an issue for us. We talk about it all the time. But it wasn't even in the reader's guide to, re to periodical literature in the early 20th century, not even emerging then until 1920, 1930. Okay? Uh, and so then he focuses even more in terms of the churches on this issue. From the beginning of the 20th century up until 1968, no Christian denomination 
in America, Methodist or otherwise, passed a resolution or re released a report that directly addressed homosexuality. So this kind of cultural change that we're in the midst of is recent. It's very recent. It's very recent indeed. The U.S. population as a whole in 1973, only 11% in 1973 viewed homosexuality, the practice of, as moral. Okay? And those uh, demographics, of course, have shifted. Where are evangelicals in 2012? Well, 25% of evangelicals in 2012 and 40% of black Protestants endorse gay marriage. That, those numbers are higher than the general public in 1988, where only 12% endorsed homosexual marriage. See, what happens here, uh, people, I always look at demographics when I'm looking at religion in America in terms of what we're going to have, what's the future going to be. And here's the phenomenon. You may not like this, but here's what happens. Um, older folk uh, who hold the traditional values, what happens? They die off. They go away. That's what happens. They go away. They're, they're not here anymore. They die. The younger generation that doesn't know anything else, they're schooled in this view, and now the view is culturally powerful. Okay? It, it's a simple matter of following the human life cycle in terms of older populations you know, going off to eternity and new ones coming in, never knowing any other view, any other view. Uh, and so here's where I push back. I'm pushing back hard uh, with, with Mark Smith. I, I hope he's not right, but we need to talk about this, and we need to talk about this first. Um, Here's what he says. Culture is more powerful than religion in determining a person's moral code. See, I, 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 I do push back on that. And I say, and I'm saying this personally for Ken Collins. I'm just speaking for myself. No. No. It may be for the numbers, and we're going to talk about that in a few moments, the numbers of Christianity, Christendom, you know, uh, public Christianity, nominal Christianity, yeah, it may be true for them, but hopefully that's not true for people like us, and I'm, ass I'm assuming you're with me on this, because you have taken the time and trouble to be at this conference. You're a special class in and of itself just because of that. I assume that you want to be a serious disciple of Jesus Christ, that you, your conscience is a slave. That's a good word here in this context. A slave of Jesus Christ. A slave, a servant, a doulos of the Holy Spirit. That you cannot do otherwise. You cannot do otherwise. My conscience is captured uh, by Jesus Christ. That he is the lodestar uh, of my life. What's okay. the definition of religion? <laughs> we're we're going to take some questions at the end. That's how I proceed. And I should have said that. Thank you for rem reminding me. I'm, when I lecture, I take questions at the end, and I will. I want to hear you, uh, and we will be dialogical, but thank you. Thank you. So a culture is more powerful than religion in determining a person's moral code. Do you want to find out what people think. He says the best predictor of people's moral beliefs are not their religious convictions. Not their religious convictions. Or the lack thereof. But where and when they were born. Where and when they were born. Were you born in the South in the 19th century in the United States of America? He has a good clue of what you think about things. Okay? Were you born in the 21st century? You see? Uh, in the north, in Massachusetts, uh, he has a good window on what you think morally, politically about things. Uh, okay. Uh, well, he argues Christians often reinterpret or ignore the Bible. That's what they do in the face of cultural change. Or they come up with, quote, quote, new understandings, new meanings, new interpretations. 
uh, to fit uh, the, the context. Okay. Now, for me, Smith raises this issue for us, uh, and I, I think it's an important one. Uh, how do we define the church? How do we define the Christian faith? Uh, what constitutes being a Christian? Uh, he raises this issue for us. He is appealing to what I would call public Christianity. The Christianity has the numbers. You know, the people who would check off on some survey, yes, I'm a Christian, but they rarely go to church. Okay? But they would identify themselves on some level as being a Christian. Okay? Because I would argue, as a student of church history, that serious disciples of Jesus Christ um, have always been few, always, throughout the history of the church. Their numbers have never been large. We need to understand that. We need to understand that. Whether we're talking about uh, the first century, when the church is being persecuted by Jews, whether we're talking about the fourth century, uh, when the church is being persecuted by the Roman state, or whether we're talking about the Middle Ages when it was socially, culturally, and economically advantageous to be a Christian, that the numbers were not many, few. Those who in their hearts, in the throne room of their being and personality, surrendered to the authority, the lordship of Jesus Christ. Those numbers have always been few. It's just now we're getting a greater sense of that. We're getting a much greater sense of that. Jesus Christ himself said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father. Okay? Again, Jesus clearly states when someone asked him, Will the numbers of the saved be many or few? Enter through the narrow gate, for wide, wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leadeth to destruction. The path that leads to destruction is popular. It's socially and culturally affirmed. It has always been. The basic truth of the kingdom of God has been kept from us because we have confused public, culturally accommodated Christianity with the proper Christian faith. It is not. John Wesley understood this very well. See, I, I eventually got to Wesley. But I got to Jesus first, so we got the right order. John Wesley understood this very well in his own age. What, what's the major question he continually had before him and the Methodists? What does it mean to be a real, true, proper, scriptural, at one point he even writes rational, Christian? What does it mean to be a real, true, proper, scriptural Christian? Christian? Because that's what he wanted to be. Now, people in Wesley's 18th century context, they thought he was crazy. They thought he was, he was touched. They thought he was a fanatic, an enthusiast. Why? Because of raising that very question. Their answer was, how could you not be a Christian? You're an Englishman. You were born in England. You were baptized as an infant in the Church of England, in the Anglican Church. You grew up, your father was an Anglican priest, your mother uh, gave you a religious education that was second to none. You yourself were ordained. And then on top of that, you took on the labors and toil of, of undertaking a missionary journey to a, a strange land. And you asked the question, am I a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? See, now, now Wesley's got my attention. He definitely has my attention. Because he is calling into question precisely what everyone else so easily assumes. Now you've got my attention. What more is there? What more could there be 
to being a Christian? In what way have I missed out? See, that's what Wesley, he knows he's missed out. He knows. He knows it. He knows it in his heart. He said, I rose, I fell, I rose only to fall again. He was on that spiritual roller coaster ride, sinning, repenting, sinning, repenting, and people were comforting him in it. That is the Christian life. That's all you can hope for. But he knew that Christ died for more than to leave people in the bondages of which they are ashamed. And so John Wesley, John Wesley was humble and honest enough to say, I have fallen short. I've missed something here. I've got the trappings of Christianity, but I have missed the core. I have missed the core. And so he is, he is biologically, biologically fascinating. We're in a different place from John Wesley. Um, the Constantinian church, Constantinian Christianity in this country has been gone. It's been gone for a long time. Uh, I like to date it around the Scopes trial. Um, uh, others date it uh, 1933. That basically there was a separation in this country between Christianity and the culture. I mean, look in the 19th century in America. Uh, the, cu the, shake, the cultural shakers and movers are Christians in the 19th century. They are. Bishop Matthew Simpson is meeting with Lincoln. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. And that ship comes in the, in the 20th century. Uh, Robert Handy wrote a book, a very important book, um, The Quest for Christian America. And he dates that it's all over. The culture has separated itself, he says, 1933, in the midst of the Depression, after the Scopes debacle. But it's, it's even more difficult than this. It's even more difficult than this. And so many of the social, cultural, and political props for the Christian faith either have been or are in the process of being stripped away. They're being stripped away. If we've taken comfort and support in, in the cultural and sociological power of the Christian faith, we're going to be very disappointed in the days ahead. Um, we not only live in a post-Christian era, but, and you, you know this, we live in a culture now that has become increasingly hostile to the Christian faith. Increasingly hostile to the Christian faith. Indeed, if we take a look at the American cultural elite, and that is the editors of the New York Times, the Washington Post, look at leading university professors as well as judges sitting on important benches. In their mind, in their view, it is a shameful thing to be an evangelical Christian. It is a, sh it is a thing of shame. And so in light of this, this culture that we live in, you know, what are we to do? What are we to do? Will we too, according to Smith, will we fall away? Will be, we be compromised, accommodated subtly, very subtly? We'll make that shift. We'll go along. We'll sell out. There's a good, there's a good phrase. Sell out. Sell out Christ. Barter away our allegiance, our identity to Jesus Christ? Is that what we will do? Because we want the approval of those who reject the gospel? Because they're culturally powerful? You see? And so, I think what's happening now, and some may say this is a good thing, what's being sloughed off from the churches right now are nominal Christians. Nominal Christians, they're not showing up anymore. They're, they're, they're going away. But that means that those who are left uh, are those who are serious disciples of Jesus Christ. What date do I put for that when that process began? 1962. 1962. That's when the SDS issued the Port Huron Statement. The Port Huron Statement. Uh, you know, their radical agenda for American culture 
Uh, what we're witnessing today in this country, uh, 2016, is that the new left, what, what sociologists and historians call the new left, has come to power. And, and I find this so amazing because, uh, you know, I remember that, that period of time, and you may be old enough to remember that period of time as well, and, and the key, one of the key slogans was, speak truth to power. Speak truth to power. But see, now they have become the establishment, and, and they don't want truth speaking anymore. Uh, they want censorship. They want speech codes. Uh, they talk about microaggressions. They talk about trigger warnings. And so the whole enterprise of what we call education, which is a dialogue in which we listen to each other. That's what education is. It's a dialogue in which we listen to each other. That has shut down. And it's shutting down. Yeah, that's shutting down. I look at the American universities now, and you know, people, we, we were at the dinner table the other night talking about homeschooling. I don't know, I think we need to homeschool college students. <laughs> I think we need to homeschool graduate students. Because I don't think in many respects, you can get an education any longer. Education is a free and open discussion. And education is disturbing. It's disturbing. We should expect that. I hope you expect that. I hope in this conference you are disturbed at some point. That you're shaken, you're moved, you're not where you're going to be. You're, 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 you're challenged to something more. That's the whole process of education. You know, I... I grew up with a very strong background in philosophy and critical thinking, and the faith that I hold today, and this has been helpful to my students, has been a faith that has walked the gauntlet. You know what a gauntlet is? Okay, a gauntlet where you get clubbed as you're walking through. Can you make it to the other side? It's a faith that's walked the gauntlet of every test you can throw at it. Jesus Christ is on the other side. On the other side. The only time that the Christian faith does not do well, and there are times when it doesn't do well, is when people come in and they silence us. They limit what we can say. The speech is not open and free. But every time I've seen an open and free discussion, the Christian faith always does well. I hope you know that. We have some of the greatest minds in the history of humanity, Thomas Aquinas being one of them. Okay, but you never hear the name Thomas Aquinas. You're, you're too bedazzled by Einstein, you see. But you need to think about Aquinas, you really do. Um, uh, and so the question for us then, in the face of these tectonic shifts, is what shall we do? I'm going to stop there. I promised that I would entertain questions and we'll dialogue. Let's have that dialogue now. Yes. What was the definition of religion? Yeah. Because I, I run into that all the time, and I accept the classical definition of religion as man's search for God, whereas I define life in Jesus as God's search for man, which is utterly and totally opposite. Yeah, he doesn't get into that kind of detail. I understand what you're saying. I've heard the argument before. Um, you know, he's, I'm not sure if he's a sociologist or a historian or, or what the framework is here, but, you know, he just sees Christianity as one of the major world religions, and he's considering it in that venue, that, that vein. But I know exactly what you're talking about, yeah. Uh, yeah. If someone said that to me um, as, a, as a reason why they don't want to identify with a religion, uh, I probably would talk to them about uh, freedom. I would talk to them about freedom, uh, being free from sin, being free from envy, selfishness, crippling lust, talking about what it is to be uh, a, a full human being living into the image of God in which we were created. And I think if I started to go down there, that person's going to realize 
that in some important ways, they're actually in bondage. They're actually in bondage. They're not free. Uh, and so that, that would be an opportunity for them to take a look at the kinds of um, slaveries that they participate in, and they may even have identified as who they are as a person. So I, I would take it that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. When you were talking about the, the older generation, you said they were dying off. Right. Do you think that, uh, where do you think that that shift happens where they stop intentionally making disciples who were transformed from within, like, like, uh, like Phil was talking about, to where they were just making converts instead of sort of growing disciples and having that sort of intentional relationships with accountability and things like that? Because it seems like the old guard that's dying off was the one that it seems like the heyday, you know, the church was big and growing, was at the center of the culture, and they knew how to be committed Christians in terms of being committed to religion, but not necessarily with the, the transformed heart and life that can pass on that spiritual DNA, so to speak, of, of being, uh, being faithful about teaching and being a Yeah, yeah. I think actually you're talking about two different things, um, and I want to distinguish them, and also a, a point of clarification. I, no, none of my comments uh, were meant to suggest that the work of serious Christian discipleship hasn't been ongoing. It has. Uh, you know, uh, the gates of hell you know, will not prevail against the church. Uh, God always has God's people in every age. The work of serious discipleship and those who uh, love the Lord their God with all their heart, th that goes on in every age. But what you're talking about uh, are the kind of broader cultural trends that Smith is talking about that's been going on as well, but they're sort of like, you know, uh, two different tracks in a certain, in a certain sense. Um, the culture has changed. Uh, Christianity's status vis-a-vis -vis culture has changed. Um, and it may never be what it once was. Uh, but the work of serious Christian discipleship goes on, goes on. But my point is that I think it is enormously helpful that we in the church who love the Lord and who care about being a real, true, proper, scriptural Christian, that we need to understand the context in which we operate so that, so that it's in order to, in order that we will be more effective uh, disciples of Jesus Christ in terms of ministering, evangelizing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. In the back. Uh, what would you attribute to the separation between church and culture circa 1920? What, if any role, do you see in possibly the late 19th century and the later uh, even the uh, modernist worldview? And what can we learn from St. Paul? See, I hear a couple of things in your question. On the one hand, I hear you know, the uh, progressive movement in the 19th century and into you know, the early 20th century. Yeah, um, I think I can illustrate that by lifting up the whole area of prohibition. That was a progressive cause. And, and it was the kind of thing that, um, among Protestants, it wasn't a liberal conservative issue. Everyone was in favor of it. They were in favor of, of prohibition. Um, you know the history there. The, the act was passed. It lasted a little over a decade. And then there was a kind of retrenchment that set in. And the culture pushed back hard and said, we don't want this. We don't want the prohibition. It actually has been conducive to crime and, and all sorts of very negative things. And with that pushback uh, came further distancing between the American culture and many Christians who were a part of the progressive movement uh, and who got behind prohibition. So prohibition is actually a good example of where there was a popular Christian cause. The culture, in the end, rejects it and in that rejection distances itself further from the Christian faith. 
from public Christianity. Yes. Uh, in the back here, and then you. Yes. Yeah. Speak up, please, because you're way in the back. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, seven, he actually says seven to eight percent. In 1908, divorce rate was seven to eight percent, he says. Yes. Yes. Um, in terms of uh, the issue on homosexuality, um, it, black Protestants was 40%. Uh, he says a greater share of evangelicals, 25%. Black Protestants, 40%. Endorsed gay marriage in 2012. And the source for that uh, is Smith's book. Um, I only have, I don't have a page number, I only have Kindle locations number. Uh, it's 2657, 2658 on Kindle locations. So I, I read it as a Kindle book, which, yeah. Um, so uh, you had your hand. Yeah, yeah, I'm serious when I say this. I've been thinking about it. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I hear you, and I think what's so important here, in terms of your context here at Boston University, I, I think about this in terms of narratives. That there are there are two narratives that are playing out here. The one narrative is from the culture. Call it what you want, you know. Call it neo-leftist multiculturalism, whatever. Yeah. You know? But then there is the narrative of what is it? It's the greatest story that's ever been told, or that could ever be told. See, I would challenge anybody in a secular university, the English department, for example, at the University of Washington come up with a greater story than the gospel, and I'll listen to you. I really will. I know for me, I cannot believe in a God who has not come because the issue of human suffering is just too great. It's too great. I, it gets clobbered. It doesn't, it doesn't walk the gauntlet. I could never worship Allah. Does Allah love me? I don't know. I've read the Quran three times. I don't know if Allah loves me. I don't know if Allah cares. Could I worship, hear me now, could I worship the God of the Jews today as Judaism is practiced? Thinking of what John says, he who denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that's the spirit of Antichrist. I can't worship that God either. I can't worship a God who doesn't come. Who is Jesus Christ? The Logos made flesh. See, I, I'm very clear in my Christology. The Logos made flesh. That God cared enough to come. And not only to come, I mean that's humbling enough to become a human being. A man among men and women. But then to go further. To the lowest depths of human existence. Amidst mocking and shame, and despising, and taunting. 
There is the love of God in the strangest of places. Nails cannot destroy it. Taunting cannot weaken it. Hatred cannot overcome it. This is, this is the strongest. This is the strength of God. And here is that great transvaluation. A man crucified on a tree amidst mocking and shame. And here is God. Here is the love of God. A strength far greater than all human strength. You see? And so, you know, I think there are narratives playing out here. So let's talk about those narratives. I would argue that the church has the treasure. It is a treasure. The greatest story that has ever been told or that could ever be told. You can't, you can't come up with a greater story that God has come. God has come. And you know what I would say? And this is bold. <laughs> I'm going out here, but this is where I am. If God hadn't come in Jesus Christ, God should have come. God should have come. And if God were God, God would have come. See what, you see what I'm saying? So, so I think, and, and once again, the church has the goods. It's that we haven't had this conversation. Why? Because we're called bigots. We're called haters. We're called every ugly name in the book. Why? To shut the conversation down. Because they know if we have the conversation, we win. We win. We do. We do. I've seen it again and again. I've seen it again and again. I have a colleague, Jerry Walls, Dr. Jerry Walls. He's no longer here. He teaches at Houston Baptist. And he debated an atheist at UK. And so, you know, we're getting all set for the debate. And this was wonderful because there were 1,500 young people, 1,500 young people at this UK auditorium. And Dr. Walls debated this atheist, you know, no holds barred. You can say whatever you want to say as an atheist. This theologian is going to say whatever he wants to say. He won the debate soundly. And I was sitting back there. I had goosebumps running all over my body as I look out on these young people and they saw that. Our culture doesn't want you to see that. That's the new pornography. Yeah, they don't want you to see that. They don't want you to see that light. So cut, shut off the conversation quickly through name calling. Give a negative label, the darkest label as possible. Shut down the conversation. That's not education, that's ideology. That's ideology, and that's, it's bullying, it's bullying. Sherman, I saw your hand, I think you're gonna have to be the last one because we have to take a break. I saw your hand. I, I just have a, a question probably of guilt. <laughs> I'm hearing confessions this afternoon. Uh, and, uh, and you mentioned 1962. Yes. I'd like to hear what Dr. Martin thinks about that. Wait <laughs> 
All right.